post-January camp. It's after. We waited and waited. We finally got it. And seven goals and some triumph for Dave. And we'll get to David Ferreira in just a second. <laughs> Uh, a reminder here in Los Angeles. Will we get to Davi Ferreira, or are we just going to mention him when we talk about Jesus? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> should we? <laughs> we should leave that, Weavy. <laughs> wow. Nice. Back and forth between the two. I mean, he looked a little bit like his dad in around the 18. Oh, from Kansas City, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental. From my basement, I'm Andrew Weavy with my partners in soccer, David Goss. Matt Doyle, oh, Jesus Ferreira, coming good, coming good. The U.S. national team coming good. I mean, it was hard for them not to against uh, the opponent on this day, but a touchdown, 7 nothing. We will talk about that. We will talk about all the rumors. It is transfer deadline day, at least uh, over across the pond, and a lot of Americans involved, a lot of MLS players involved. Loan moves, Aaron Long, some done deals. We'll get to all that. Jordan Morris making his debut for Swansea, despite just a little bit, just a little bit of a taste. Uh, before we get to that, though, remember, go check out the call-up. Jordan Angeli, friend of the show, was the most recent guest on the call-up. Always want to get you over there. So, so go subscribe to that and subscribe to us if you're not already. All right, let's just get to it. Uh, I want to know how you experienced Jesus Ferreira, the resurgence, <laughs> everything we would hope for. I just wrote about Jesus. Take it back to 2019, man. Back to 2019. And he took it way back. I mean, this is a, it's a great performance. It's what you want out of January camp. That one, two, three performances to just make you smile and give him a chance. Yeah, about a week ago, I got on a call with Greg Berhalter. We talked through the lineup. Uh, <laughs> I gave my points. He gave his points. Some of his points made no sense, so I asked him to switch them around. Then I came on this show. I presented that lineup, and we worked together from there. That's what good teams do. That's what great teams do. Uh, I was actually driving during the first half of this game because I'm sort of on vacation here, and turns out that uh, the house that I was coming to had no heat, and I was required to come out <laughs> pre-Blizzard in New York to uh, – help get the heat on, which turns out was impossible. So the first half I watched after the second half, the second half I turned on in 45 degree weather, watching it on 2D and great broadcast. Hey, I'm sorry. And if you, that... if you, if this bothers you, that's just my furnace. Oh, this noise. If that, if it, I don't know if it's coming through on the record. Ours just it... got fixed and we're up to 48 degrees in here. Ooh. Let's go. I might just take all of this off now. This is the warmest oh it's been in 24 hours. <laughs> not that type of, not type of that, that type of podcast. So you didn't watch no, this game. It would game. take me the full show to get all of this off. Anyway. <laughs> you didn't, oh, you didn't watch the game in sequence. You didn't I did see not watch the, game in sequence. the immediate gloriousness that was Jesus yeah. Ferreira. I mean, I turned on, saw the highlights, Anders texted me and said, hey, Zeus, baby. <laughs> then I watched the game, and then I went back and rewatched the first half. And uh, my Siri really wants to talk and search Jesus Ferrer right now, and he keeps doing it. You have uh, yeah. seven goals. Was it, was it the type of performance? Forget the, the, the box score stats, but in terms mm -hmm. of what he was doing as a, as a false nine, was it what you expected from him? Uh, well, no, because I didn't even have him as <laughs> when I put the formation together. That's right. You had him as a winger. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you I, know, I but still, look, Greg we, does I think what he we, wants. I think we talked about it on the show, though, or I don't know if it was on the show, where you said, what do I like that he does? And I said, the way he sets people up, the way he feels the game, it's those touches in zone 14. That's where he lives, to me, when he's at his best. And I think that's what you saw. Even when he went into the channels and he pulled the goalkeeper out, it was then a quick layback for Paul Ariola finding Jonathan Lewis. Those instincts, his playmaking instincts are – why I'm so high on him. I've seen him play the false nine before from like 15 years old on. And there are moments where I like him. And then there are moments where I wonder what the ceiling is for a player like him at that position. Uh, clearly Burhalter likes him there. And I don't hate that idea because when I look at the best U S national team, 11, you've got goal scorers on the wings and you've got Weston McKinney coming out of midfield. You don't need a guy at center forward. Who's going to be the one who leads the line in goal scoring. But it would be nice if you had someone who did both. And so I thought for Ferreira, it was all about confidence this week, as Weavy said. And I think he got that. You saw the smile. You saw the energy. And I think that's what Berhalter wanted as well. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I mean, these are – I just to know that for a month that that is among all the options that Greg had, and he had a lot. And he had a lot that people were crowing for and saying, hey, Daryl DK, why is he not in this team? Yeah. I thought it was uh, awesome to see that Jesus had earned it because obviously he did. You don't go through a camp like that and get into the starting lineup with just one bite, 
Like, it's not like you had two games, two opportunities. It's not like they're going to say, okay, well, you know we're going to rotate. I mean, this was it. And then for him to perform, and then Paul Ariel was out here doing the swan, and Jonathan <laughs> Lewis, you're like, yeah, wait, man. Wait, wait, wait. That apparently was not a swan. What that's was it? Just, that's just his celebration. He's been doing that for years. <laughs> oh, so my gosh. DC, DC fans were like, no, man, that's a, that's a screaming eagle celebration. So. <laughs> you know what? This is a call, and I know some do it great, some don't do it the best, but. Uh, just please focus on goal scores for like 15 seconds after they score all television broadcasts. That would be amazing. <laughs> I am always waiting, and then it cuts at the wrong moment. Uh, do we want to keep – I mean, how does this translate for Jesus now to Dallas? Because we talked about it. Where is he fitting that's on the field? Big, no, that's the big question. So, like, where is it – what now for FC Dallas? It, it's it's a huge question. I mean, Dallas's forwards were not impressive last year. Franco uh, really struggled. Pepe came on at, at the end, but – he wasn't really being used as a as a true number nine, um, which is I, I think a mistake. And uh, I, I think it was John Strong and, and Stu Holden during the game were talking about how Burhalter said he and Luci Gonzalez don't really see Ferreira in the same way, uh, the same type of player, um, which is fine. Like th- there are disagreements all the time between you know national team and club coaches about what a, a player's best position is. Uh, I would say in that argument. After last night, and also after last year's friendly um, against Costa Rica, in which Ferreira played the false nine and was very good, uh, point Berhalter in that in that argument. But it, it is the January camp. It is one of the poorest teams I, I think I've I've ever seen the U.S. play in the January <laughs> camp. So it, it's like club form really really matters. And it, Jesus Ferreira, whatever position it's at. He's going to have to really produce for for FC Dallas, at least at his 2019 levels, um, if he's going to stay in the mix, uh, regardless of you know how well he performed. It was a legendary performance, uh, regardless of how well he performed against the, the Trinidad and Tobago C team. Yeah, at best. Uh, at best. Is this also just like a, a preview of Olympic qualifying, maybe? I mean, maybe that's that, that's part of the part of what I wrote for my, you know, what did we take away from the camp? So usually with, with January national team camp, I, I conceive of it as, OK, what are the guys from 15 to 30 on the roster on the depth chart showing in terms of like who's who's where in the hierarchy? And from that perspective for the U.S. national team, you could say, OK, Jonathan Lewis, who str- clearly struggled last year at this time because he got beat out for the starting spot, made a statement by clearly beating out Chris Mueller and then backing it up with his play on the field. Um, but there is the the added issue of Olympic qualifying, which is next month now. It's about six weeks away. And that's all U23s, players born January 1st, 1997 or later. And six of the 11 starters against Trinidad and Tobago were U23 eligible. Ferreira, Lewis, Ewell, uh, Herrera, Robinson, and Vines. And I think it is a relatively safe takeaway to look at that and say, well, Ferreira is ahead of Daryl DK. And he's ahead of Jeremy Abobasi, who didn't even make the game day roster. Um, you know, Ewell has locked down his his spot as the starter for that team. So usually you don't take too much away from and, and again in the in the big picture national team, I don't think you take that much away, but you are free to take a lot more away uh, in terms of the U23s for Olympic qualifying. It'll be interesting at center forward if this is the pitch to Io to get him in the camp and say, you're the starter going into the Olympics qualifying for us. So that will be interesting for that with Ferreira. Just last thing is there's a, there's a flexibility. That's really great for a young player. If they can play a lot of positions coming up because that gets them on the field. And then there's a line that you hit, which is, well, will you never establish yourself at one position Mm -hmm. and have an image and a model and be great at one thing that teams like want you for Ferreira's reaching that line where I could tell you he's going to start 24 games this year because he'll do it at center forward 10, left wing, right wing for Dallas, and there's enough spots and minutes in there for him to get those starts. The question is, if he's going to be the guy we thought he could be three years ago because he was one of the top prospects coming through the FC Dallas Academy, he has to be great at one thing, and teams have to go out and get him because they're looking for a great number nine, a true 10, a goal dangerous winger, whatever it is. And so he's kind of at that line now where 
it's okay that he does a lot of things well because he just needs to get minutes, but he needs to figure out that one great thing. And hence Lucci and, and Greg disagreeing on it. It's not super obvious because mm-hmm. he's good at a lot of things. He's not great at anything. He's great so, at fight. He's great at finding space. He, he really, naturally he, feels the game. From he where. has, yeah, he has that, that, that Thomas Mueller type of like space interpreter gene. Uh, and, and we saw that last night because he, he, I mean, he was never in the wrong spot and it was kind of spectacular to watch. And, that is the type of thing that a really cohesive system with uh, talent superiority on the wings and central midfield and the fullbacks can can make great use of. So maybe, I mean, maybe his future role for the U.S. is is cupcake smasher, right? Maybe because, yeah. like, he's so hard to track. Maybe if you're playing a, a El Salvador or a weakened Trinidad side and, and you just want to get through it without, you know, burning – let's say Josh Sargent is the number one, you don't want to burn him for 90 minutes. Maybe that is, is Jesus Ferreira's role. Um, as it stands, I I would not be surprised if that's what the future holds. And I'm not going to say that it, I'm not going to say that he has a bigger role for the national team until he starts showing it for the club team at one position or another. You just, you have to do that. Bring us uh, back to 2019, Jesus. Do it, man. Yeah. So can <laughs> do it, man. Say- I need that. I thought the best moment of the game was Vines' ball in the first goal. I was just about for to bring one it time in. curls into that back line to run onto, and he had the assist on the second goal. So he did all the things. I mean, he barely had to defend it. Again, this is maybe the worst opponent the U.S. has played in a really long time, if ever. Um, he didn't have to do a lot defensively, but he showed the spark from left back, which I trust him defensively already. And so if he shows he can do this stuff and keep doing it at a higher level then he shows that he can be on the field. Were you surprised by his ability to hit that ball? No, I think he's gotten better on the ball as the years gone. The years have gone along the last two years. Most of what you see from him is getting to the end line. That's a weird ball. It shouldn't exist in he a high-level game. He hit the ball. He's hit that ball now in each of his three national team appearances. Ooh, he hit that ball. Go. He had an assist on the, uh, the Areola goal against El Salvador last month with the exact same ball, though it was instead of uh, – so uh, against Trinidad and Tobago, Lewis pinched inside mm-hmm. and that opened the lane. And then Ferreira extended with that direct run against uh, against El Salvador. It was Mueller who was on the left wing. He spun inside and then made it an outward run to the flank. And that was able to unlock the defense for the pullback to Areola. And then he also hit that same ball last year. The exact same ball last year against Costa Rica in that friendly, and uh, Uliana's just couldn't finish it. So, like Sam Vines has clearly got that in his in his bag. Like he and he understands. It's like Ferrer in terms of his movement. He just he seems to have a really good understanding of what the uh, the system calls for, and how to be the one who unlocks it. And if you watch the way the U.S. play now, and it's tough to. Okay, this is – we haven't seen a ton of it against higher-level opponents. But if you watch the way the U.S. play, the, the the runs from the front three and then the two attacking midfielders are so well-coordinated when it's either either the fullbacks or Ewell at D-mid up at the midfield stripe, able to pick their head up. One checks and the other goes. If the, if the winger stays wide and provides an opportunity for a diagonal, then it's – the, the attacking midfield, Kellen Acosta last night, Brendan Aronson, you know, last month, they make the direct run and they create that type of chaos in uh, in the opposing back line. And then that, it, like either the ball is played to them and because Vines and Ewell and Herrera are all very good passers of the ball, those passes tend to get completed or they play underneath because by causing that much chaos in the opposition back line, you open up space in zone 14, which is, of course, where Jesus Ferreira did a lot of his work last night. So it's fun for me to see these patterns of play get uh, drilled and drilled and drilled and applied and applied and applied game after game after game. And I think it, other than just the overall talent and depth in the player pool now, because you could go down like, six names at almost every position. Um, that is the thing that is giving me the most joy and happiness about the U S national team is like, they go out there with a plan and they execute it and they've done it with like four 
vastly different lineups in the past four games. Well, I guess three vastly different lineups in the past three games and smashing the hell out of the likes of El Salvador and Trinidad and Tobago and Panama. That's how you get back to the world cup. Beating the hell out of those teams. What do you think about um, the way Burhalter wants them to play out of possession against the higher level team? Because you can't really press a team. You can counter press, but you can't really press a team that isn't going to play out of the back. And Trinidad stopped doing that after a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. What do you see from what he wants to do uh, going forward? I mean, he's the biggest adjustment from Greg Berhalter over his two years has been his defensive approach because they were in 2019, they were a mid block four, four, two or four, you know, four, two, two, two defensive team. And they have really changed to um, a four, three, three high pressing team that sometimes is a four, two, three, one uh, kind of a high block, but not necessarily pressing team. And they do this very good job of gumming up central midfield right? Just making it a, a no-fly zone. And then once they have induced a long switch to either sideline, they press against the sideline real hard. And like everybody is on point with that. Every like Defensively, they, they did not put a foot wrong other than when Andres Pereira came in and he gets a mulligan because it's his first national team appearance. Um, and then the other thing is like, okay, if, if teams start trying to play over the top of that, Good luck winning aerials against Aaron Long and Miles Robinson. Good luck against John Brooks and Matt Miazga and Walker Zimmerman and hopefully Chris Richards. And, and like every defensive scheme, it, you're, it's, it's trade-offs, right? You're going to be good at pressing. That that might open you up for a long ball, and that's what the center backs are for. And at some point, the U.S. are going to get burned, and it's more likely to happen against Mexico than it is against Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but like that's the game. Like that is what every coach in the world is trying to do. And I think that what we have seen from Burhalter over the past year has indicated that he has had a come to Jesus moment about the strengths of this roster. And I'm, I'm very happy because with a few, only a few quibbles here and there, like the way he seems to view it um, is like the exact way that I seem to view it. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's kind of worked. And so, so I, I totally agree with you. And this was my thought process is I think it was the Brazil, Mexico friendlies two years ago when he'd first gotten in and obviously hadn't had a ton of time to work where mm -hmm. Tyler was the only one pressing anywhere because yep. it wasn't really in the game plan. And when but we talk Sarah, about wasn't Sarakin, wasn't Sarakin still the head coach then? I don't remember. You may be right. Yeah. Yeah. That was 2018. So it was still Sarah. Yeah. But it's just, we talk about Greg Berhalter. And to his credit, because of the ways he puts teams together, you talk about possession with him because he's so good at it and the things he wants his team to do and how fun it is. And off the ball, I totally agree with you that I think not just game plan, but culturally, this is a young U.S. team that wants to press. They want to attack teams. They want to be involved in the game. You see how Weston plays and what he's done so great at Juve is just his ability to cover and be involved and be engaged at all times. And obviously what Tyler does at his best and so that's what's exciting to me from what I'm seeing is even in this game, and I think Stu and, and um, John brought it up at the right point of like 30, 40 minutes in, they showed Burhalter just like yelling to them, press, press, like yep. trying to get on top of Trinidad and Tobago, even though they were up 3-0 and it was whatever January friendly. That's what's exciting to me is the top level talent is going to fit into that really well. And it's going to set a tone of like, we're going to go out to win these games. We're not yeah. going out to survive. And for these young players, that's a 10 to 15 year tone. That's the future of the national team. And that's what's exciting. And that's what I've taken from these last few games is just the energy he's having them put out defensively and the way he wants them to set up. I really miss club and country so much. <laughs> Got to sit in a, in a room. Here's, there's a lot to this here. A lot of folds. Got to sit in a room and just watch the game and focus on that. Talk to you guys as it goes. Feel like you got a good feel. I got to go watch this thing back. Like, I'm listening to you guys, and I'm just like, oh, yes. Okay, that's uh, ringing my bell here. Meanwhile, I watched with a three-year-old and a six-month-old. <laughs> so I was playing a lot of animals, I got to tell you. Uh, I missed a lot of that. But I did I did enjoy Jonathan Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a guy that we've been waiting on to say, like, okay, so. take the step. Will you so. Take the step. <laughs> and, but maybe this is it. He still has to, again, to go back to Ferreira. He's still got to get on the field. For sure. With the Rapids, and they have – quite a lot of wingers to but be honest the win, the win for him wasn't even the game it was that greg burhalter pointed him out as the guy who'd worked the hardest the month and had proven yep. the most in training yep. that's yep. what jonathan lewis needs he can create differences in games 
he needs to start. And there's a reason he hasn't started a lot of times. And a lot of that's happening away from the games. So that was huge for him. And you know, Colorado is going to give him the shot, right? Like that they need him to be good and they want to sell him on, or if not be competitive with him in their team. I agree. Yeah, that, <laughs> no, well I mean, summed it, up. It, yeah, you have you have skin in the game. You have previous yeah. interest. You have yeah. a guy that just performed on the big stage. You know, if you as a club want to establish that, and maybe this is their first step. You know, you need to find that easy first step before you maybe get to the generation of a Vines or a Cole Bassett or whoever it is. You know, mm, yeah. establish it. Establish it. All right. What else did you like? <sighs> How many minutes <laughs> are we in here? Twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah twenty yeah. minutes, and we haven't said Matt Turner's name. Yeah, I was going to say just want for all the. For all the people out there that want to make assumptions, it was it was a, it was a fun little moment right there. <laughs> but it was um, it, Matt Turner's really good, and and I I think it's kind of crazy that people uh, do not see it uh, maybe as clearly as, as some of us who watch the games uh, do. I, I'll say it again: he's in. The, I've watched MLS from day one. He is the best pure shot stopper I've ever seen in this league. He, he just is. He doesn't make mistakes. He makes big saves. Uh, he stays big and, you know, saving a penalty. Uh, that was, that was really nicely done. Um, and I'm sure he'll, he'll get more reps with the national team. Who's number two on that list. Best pure shot stopper. Yeah. In MLS history. In MLS history. It might be Tim Howard. Yeah. Tim Howard was, was absolutely absurd. Uh, as a, but like the thing, the difference is Tim Howard was more mistake prone, uh, as a young player than, than Turner. Um, yeah. so I, I like, I, I think this kid's upside is a, a starter at a, at a top Premier League club. Um, now he might not get there because, uh, you know, things happen, but like he, you know, the eye test, the advanced stats, and the box score stats all uh, kind of align if you really want to take a look at, at what Matt Turner has done. And if we look at the way the refs have handled him with the new contract, that signs the, that shows me the they've had the conversation. They're on the mm-hmm. same page. Uh, and that is a really good move for everyone involved. It means the refs are going to get what they need from him, which is yep. playing while they need him. And then they believe they can sell him the way they need to. And he believes they're going to, pick a spot for him to be successful. We know he has the Lithuanian passport. So I think it's really promising what his next two or three years could look like. We haven't really talked about it on the show, have we? His, his like actual story. I <laughs> feel like we have, cause we're all, you know, he kind of erupted into this place where it was like this, you know, argument on the internet about where Matt Turner is on the depth chart and how good Matt Turner is. But just Matt Turner being in the position to have that conversation is pretty incredible given his past with the game. Yeah. Like, what is it? I, I just think about that path and a guy that was like, oh, I'm 16 or 15 or whatever it was. I watched the World Cup. I'm inspired. All of a sudden, 10 years later, I'm a potential top of my profession goalkeeper. That, that's crazy. I didn't it, start I, my first two years in college. Like, I, I knew the story, but I didn't really like have the association and the come together moment until last night in a lot of ways. I'm just like, no, I mean, Whoa. it. it to me, it looks like one of those "what if our best athletes chose soccer" moments, mm-hmm. right? Because, like, if you, I mean, he he is clearly an elite athlete in terms of his reflexes and hand-eye coordination and and understand like spatial understanding. And it's like, okay, this guy would have been, you know, a power-hitting left fielder or a Division One point guard or, or something in, in a it feels different like generation. A third baseman to me you need those like okay, quick there reflexes you go. yeah there you diving. go third baseman. Yeah, but is he a lefty yeah. to cover the line weaves huh is he a lefty to cover the line i don't know you know depends on how he wants to throw third, third baseman footwork. are all third yeah. baseman are all right yeah footwork's gonna be pretty really tough i with got the left hand. third base all the time for being a lefty and i couldn't make the throw who, that's, yeah, and who it was, was miserable yeah that's not your fault man so yeah. it, somebody hosed you on that I, all infielders are all yeah. righties um other than first baseman yeah yeah john allerud baby but but like this is this is a story that's um, it's great. It could happen here, in, you know, in the U S it could happen in probably Canada and, and Australia, maybe, maybe Japan where it, a guy who, you know, 10 years ago was clearly destined for another sport um, is suddenly now in this era uh, choosing soccer. And it's cool. And like, I, I was just effusive about Matt Turner and I'm rooting for him and I, I, I find it fun to watch him play. Um, but in a way, those players aren't necessarily 
the future of the national team. The future of the national team is the guys who choose soccer at eight <laughs> or ten and get into those uh, get into those academies early um, and are grown up with the game. But it's nice to be reminded that this path that he's on still exists. And can we just? I I talked about it when we came out of draft. Let's take away the national team part. Like, there are MLS teams that miss out on guys like this because they don't care. And they're, like, leaving opportunities on the board. And I said, I want you to focus on things for clubs and be great at something. There are teams that aren't great at producing homegrowns that aren't finding the Matt Turners or producing them. And that's the part that the Revs have nailed, right? They've been able to get these players out of the draft because they give them opportunities. And that's the part of the Matt Turner story I think is important is, one, there are late bloomers. There are late soccer developers. There are all these different players that are still around the U.S. soccer pool and Canadian soccer pool that you need to find ways to tap into. And that's where the uh, – you saw a lot of this. I think Stu put out the tweet of, like, where guys went to college on the field yesterday. Yeah. And, yeah. Be, and then you have half of people in the comments being like, this shouldn't be a part of our development anymore. It doesn't matter. If the players yeah. are good, you need to find them and you need to get them on a field. And you have to figure out how to do that. And there will never be one style in the U.S. because it's too big. Yep. It's too big a country. The sport's not going to be there. It's not Brazil. There's, it's never going to happen. You have to find ways to at least get the talent out of each avenue that players can exist in. Pick can over just, every stone. Can we also just throw in, in, you know, the case of a Matt Turner or certainly an Aaron Long? Or I'm looking down the roster here trying to find – Aaron Herrera probably played a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. USL. I mean, yeah. Matt yep. Turner is not here. He spent two years basically with the kickers, no, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Like, he coming out of Fairfield – not certainly not a school Those that we're stags, used to saying right? on stags. the Super Draft bo broadcast. <laughs> I mean, he needed time, and and that is where it comes to the entire system pulling together. It's an awesome story. It's a really cool he, story. He trained with Carlin Carpenter as well, who's a really well known goalkeeper coach. So he's got like he's got some like once he hit that spot where where he was able to to kind of get a look um, that was you know, he kind of rocketed to where he is now. Should we give uh, Brad Friedel a shout out here? I know that his yeah. time in New England wasn't one that we always talked about with, uh, I mean, we were, I was sold from on the jump. <laughs> the first time Brad gave us the vision, we were absolutely sold. It just didn't work out for whatever reason. But he, sometimes it takes somebody in your camp. Somebody, it takes like a Brad Friedel saying, hey, I think you could be an incredible goalkeeper and I'm also going to put you in the lineup. Yeah. And you am know, I and not that, wrong in that when he came in, wasn't Cody Cropper the starter who was. was still a young, promising, yes. former U20 overseas goalkeeper? And I, it was like a statement that Friedel put him there. It wasn't, no, it was oh, we surprise. don't really have anything at this position. It was a big surprise. Anybody else from this game before we kind of dig through this laundry list of transfers involving MLSers and national team players and everything else that's going on mm -hmm. right now? I mean, Brian Reynolds is done. Shout out to Tommy Scoops. Anybody else stand out? Like, there's just a, you know, it's a 7 0 win, so there's a lot of nice performances. Who were the upper echelon, let's say? Well, I mean, we, we covered it, right? It, it's, it's Ferreira it, and, and how about, Vine how about Areola? and Lewis. So, the point I want to make about Ariola and Aaron Long, Jackson Ewell, uh, and Vines, who are the guys who I would consider to be, oh, and legit, the guys who from this lineup who I would consider to be regulars, guys who, if we had a, a World Cup qualifier tomorrow, I think those guys would all be in the 18, and they all showed why. Um, you don't win a, a starting role with the U.S. men's national team, best 11, by your performance in, in January camp, but you can lose it with a poor performance uh, by not showing up. And we've seen guys do that, show up out of shape before or just, like, not locked in. All five of those guys looked locked in, Ariola especially. Um, that was a banger, his second goal, and his movement is so good and puts so much pressure on the, the opposition. Uh, and he knows that he's in a fight for playing time. Christian Pulisic, Gio Reyna, Jordan Morris, Tim Weah, Jonathan Lewis after last night, Chris Mueller after last month. Maybe Giannis gets the right loan move, or maybe he, he goes to Wolfsburg and, and breaks into wing. Like, there are a lot of wingers on this depth chart. And Paul Ariola is in his prime, and he knows that, and that he knows that there's nothing guaranteed, and he went out and he played like it. I thought Lejet played like it. I thought Long and Vines and Yule all played like it as well. Can I ask a random Ariola question since we're doing the U.S. thing right now? Is So we know, we think Hernan Losado wants to play 
some look of a three five two, whatever it is, with wing backs. And the rumors are fairly heavy that uh, Ariola will be going to Swansea on loan, who also play in that formation. And I've been thinking about it as a right wing back the whole time, which I think is his best position. Uh, the amount of work he does, his ability to hit crosses, that type of stuff. Is there a world, though, in which you pull him inside and his industry and the work he does in midfield, in a midfield three, is maybe not his peak, but where Ariola ends up in his career? So I, Ben Olsen actually used him as a yeah. pressing 10 for a little bit back in 2019, I believe. And there is a, there's a, there's a system where that makes sense. Just like there's a system where it makes sense for him to be a winger, which we've seen the last two games now. Um, but I think long term, most sense the most sense for for Paul Ariola is to be a wing back because yeah. he he gives you you know energy and a good level of speed and skill in both directions. Um, it would be really cool to see him with Swansea to see if he could push for promotion and to see if he's you know hopefully a, a Premier League caliber player. I think he could be. Um, but we got to see. We got to see what – because business is business, and you never know how these things are going to turn out. Spencer Smith hit us up, uh, said Aaron Herrera should have had an assist or two, uh, mm -hmm. but some some missed finishes. Dude's played the solid time his first he served camp. on the one Lewis hit right into the goalkeeper. Yeah. That was a ball. I thought it was yeah. Ariola at first because it was such a clean cross. I think it was his first touch. And then on watching it back, it was – that was perfect. Herrera's awesome. Like, and and – He's not gonna. He's nowhere near as flashy as Dest mm -hmm. or Reynolds. I, I think he's more of a Reggie Cannon type of player. Um, but like Reggie Cannon type of players are really good to have, and he's got an edge too. I don't know if you you noticed it, but in the fifty third minute, fifty fourth maybe, um, one of the Trinidad players went in and like got a yellow for mm -hmm. just taking him out. That was an orange card. Like that could have been red, and it took Herrera three minutes to get his revenge. Uh, like he does not take crap from anybody out there. He could play on the you know right fullback or left fullback. He he is probably not ever going to be a lock it down starter for the U.S. national team, but he's the exact type of guy that you want in the game day eighteen because he can plug holes and, and play with zero fear. We are officially the Aaron Herrera. We we love the guy. Yeah. Hell mean, yeah! I, I'm, Someone I'm, has to be though. I know. You know? I know, man. And I just love to hear about the moments where he gets his revenge. I don't, you know, maybe it's just me, but I just, I, I want to see that in my defender in a in a fair sporty way. I'm not advocating anything on. It was actually a little untoward dirty. here. It was but, a little, uh, he, he undercut the guy. Well, we'll let the style. referee make the judgment on that. All right, the referee. Can it's make not a game judgment. of black and white. That's true. Joel, there's a lot of gray see in the gray. soccer. See there's the gray. Flow. Uh, let's talk through some of these loans because a lot of them do relate back. But before we do it. Uh, and as we mention the clubs and as we talk about the number of players, uh, I just want to reminisce a little bit on a different era of Yanks abroad. Because we kind of talked about it on the last show, and I was really thinking about it as we built out this rundown, about how it's just not the same as mm -hmm. maybe 10, 15 years ago when you were just sort of like dredging for – you were just hoping somebody was going to hit a game day roster or you, you didn't have players littered across at big clubs or Champions League Tuesdays and Wednesdays weren't – you know, calendar highlight here, calendar highlight here. I'm going to watch three, four, five Americans have real important starting and decisive Canadians. roles. And Canadians. And Canadians, sorry. <laughs> Less of an emotional attachment, Canadians. You understand. <laughs> it's not about you. It's me. Uh, but it's just, it's so different now. And as we see all these moves get made, Brian Reynolds going to Roma off of half a season, really, of starting time. You know, Jordan Morris having a real chance at a different stage in his career to lock himself in to they he hopes I'm sure the Premier League mm -hmm. you know Aaron Long being linked with Liverpool what and having it is a weird kind of funny thing but also in the realm of reality certainly uh Chris Richards moving on one to Hoffenheim even just that little bit where he's expected to play where he has a role it just feels different it feels incredible uh, and Canadians I know are look I'm sorry I didn't list all your guys off but I know you're feeling it too like it's it's a special time I think to be a part of soccer in North America in, in that sense. And uh, I can't help but be a little bit like, you know, think back to those old days and be like, man, I was getting excited about very little at times, like Clint <laughs> Dempsey and Boca and like a couple other guys. And then very little. Yeah, it wasn't a lot. Uh, it, it is a new era, um, which is dope. Uh, because I, I think it's taken a long time for folks to 
get their heads around the fact that this is good for MLS. Sign it like so, selling Brian Reynolds doesn't mean you're losing a star. It means you're in the same global network as the biggest teams in in the entire world. Like you you are there, they are watching you, the fans are watching you. This is like this is a step forward for your club. And it then it puts pressure on you to develop the next Brian Reynolds. And guess what? MLS teams have gotten a lot better at doing that. So I think this, the the way we're talking about it, does does losing losing Paul Ariola, there were air quotes for those of you who were listening instead of watching. Does losing Paul Ariola hurt DC in a way, but it also makes DC stronger long term and puts them in a position to sign better players at home, to develop players more effectively, and to sign better players from abroad. Because like there is no reason that MLS can't be the league where the best young players in the Americas go to for a couple of years and then get sold to one of the, you know, the best clubs in Europe. Like we might be seeing something like that with Diego Rossi, though. I think I just um, gassed up uh, Reading a little bit too much if we're calling them one of the best, <laughs> but like we, we like it, it is a business model that has worked for Portuguese clubs forever. And it's a business model that I think we could see here. Um, and it, I, I enjoy – I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. From a U.S. Na- – go ahead, Weeby. No, no. I just want to say that this goes back to – you made the joke about Reading, and I just couldn't help but think that is what we're talking about. 10, 15 years ago, Reading being ambitious, going to the Premier League, going back down, that would be a, oh, my God, they're going to Reading moment. Yeah. But whereas, like, now where Matt Miazga goes to loan on Reading, you're like, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, good. Go get playing time. Go get playing time. I'm watch that one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it's just a different – App, it's just a completely different galaxy, really. And you talk about Brian Reynolds. MLS should be saying, let's put this out to the entire world, that our players are at this level. And, oh, by the way, our players are worth market value. And hopefully right. that keeps rising because you saw what Reggie Cannon went for. I mean, look, Brian Reynolds is a different player. And I guess let's just go in on it right now. Tommy Scoops, Tom Bogert, at Tom Bogert on Twitter. Uh, associate in soccer i would call him at this point i mean this is a i think he deserves a this, no, it's a this one maybe he's a promotion if you go he's toe to the, toe with fabrizio the, he's out of the mail room for a week all right let's just let's just dial it back okay all right look i mean different styles of management here i would say this is merit-based for him he's reporting it's over the deal for brian reynolds with as roma is 8.5 million up front and up to 11 million including incentives i mean that's an incredible move for fc dallas Certainly for Brian Reynolds, biggest congratulations to him. Uh, and also for MLS. Uh, and it's just incredible. And as we were saying this, apparently Daryl DK is going to Barnsley FC on loan. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Weeby. I, I, know. Your I mean, no, you didn't steal my thunder. So, I'm just – So, so here's It doesn't stop now. I mean, transfer deadline day, didn't you – we would be – I would be sitting around for MLSsoccer.com, assigned to write a post about what happened on deadline day, waiting for stuff to come in, and it would – Daryl DK would have let it. And Daryl DK – Oh, my God. It's big, but it's like at the – it's a middle – it's a mid-tier rumor for us right now. Yeah, so, so, so this is – it looks like Julia Poe from Orlando Sentinel – uh, broke this and you should go ahead and follow her on Twitter. The numbers here are staggering. So DK on loan to English side Barnsley FC, short term loan, but the deal will include an option for Barnsley to buy DK. The current option is priced at $20 million for 80% of his price. Oh. So this is it. This is this is a different ball game than it was even five years ago, and and we had you know a generation and a half of, of groundbreaking players: Demarcus Beasley with PSV, Claudio Reyna way back in the day, um, you know up to like all the great goalkeepers we had. Sasha Kleshton had a really underrated European career, you know, playing a bunch of Champions League games, and it was awesome. But the corner got turned three, four years ago. Uh, and the players who are going over there now aren't going over there as curiosities. They're not, oh, the American. He's gonna, like, they understand, teams around the world understand now that getting a talented American player is the same thing as getting a talented Brazilian or a talented Argentinian or a talented Nigerian. You're going out there and getting guys who can play. And, and it's awesome to see. It's in, like, I, again, it, I will be bummed 
if covering Daryl DK on a weekly basis is no longer part of my job, which would be the case if he goes and they exercise that option and he's a $20 million striker in the Premier League. But this only makes MLS stronger and it only makes the U.S. player pool stronger. Um, and that is a huge step for the league and for the sport in the U.S. and Canada. Also, it's one, the Marisa Do move, which is they got him through the draft and now you can fund your academy through it. If yeah. a sale like this goes, which in Orlando should be a major part of their team because it's a massive market with a ton of talent all across Florida and the Southeast. And then on top of that, I think the thing that I see from this window is, to Doyle's point of it's not a curiosity anymore, the Brian Reynolds move is massive. This is like, this would be the groundbreaking move that we'd be talking about. And while it's a big deal for AS Roma, I don't see it as we need him to hit. Yeah. I see this as this is a 6'3 wing back with talent who's played at a young age. And this is similar to bringing in someone from the Belgian League and someone from the Croatian League, or as you mentioned, from Nigeria or Ghana or these countries where you're not sure you're getting a finished product, but this is the number those big clubs take a risk at. And they say, even if it doesn't work out perfect for us, we could still move them on. And MLS has now entered that market, and that has never been the case before. And the Reggie Cannon deal was a huge deal, and it was this fight, and it was a long-held thing. And now what? Seven months later, Brian Reynolds goes for double the number to a Champions League borderline team, currently top four in Serie A. And that's where MLS has entered. That's why the Brian Reynolds move is exciting to me. Not just the pure number. It's this is now a market that people are going to look at and say, yeah, sometimes you'll get Diego Rossi and Miguel Almiron, who are fairly finished products and you know what they are, even though they're still young. But you can go here and say, there's potential there that we're going to take a risk on. And MLS has entered this fluid market where you loan guys for a few months and get them back. And if it doesn't work out, you can sell them somewhere else or they play for you. And that has never existed before. Weeby, you're muted. I was typing. <laughs> The other thing about this deal, I wonder what else I didn't say or did say that made it into this podcast, is that it wasn't just AS Roma. And it wasn't like in the Reggie Cannon deal, one of the things that stuck out was that, yes, there was other reported interest, but you didn't quite have the like established camps helping drive that price to a place where it did end up. And you didn't have FC Dallas able to maybe play the game in that way. Whereas this time you have you have Juve, you have Bruges, you have Roma, mm -hmm. you have established, ambitious, good uh, good moves, all of them would be for club and for Brian Reynolds, all in the mix. And that sort of, that competition and that acknowledgement, like bigger than just one or two clubs in Europe, of saying like, oh, that's a good player. We all need that player. That's also what's going to drive it up can for we, as well. Can we use this as a time to just talk real quick, not to bring it down about hour long and what it means? Because we're talking about MLS teams being willing to let guys go and kind of open their market. And Red Bulls have sold, and the rumors are on Caden Clark now again, but... It's interesting, the Aaron Long move. And I'm not, I don't have 100% set my mind where I think. I think there's a half where you say the Red Bulls think Aaron Long helps them win now and they're willing to hold on to him. That means there's an intent to win, which I think their fan base has felt hasn't always been there over the last few years. On the flip side, if he's upset and he wanted to go and you didn't make that happen, have you slightly closed the doors, not just to him, but to future players who would choose you and to clubs from overseas who felt like, Maybe at the last minute, they kind of got screwed out of a deal. And are they worried about getting into business with you with a deadline coming up? And so mm. it's interesting the way this has ended up. We don't know the details yet, uh, but it's interesting how this has gone about as these other moves are happening. I didn't hear from Long. I, I don't feel like, and, and look, he just did the one interview, I think, on Sirius XM. Like maybe the urgency that you felt, what was it, two summers ago with the West yeah. Ham? It didn't. I didn't hear the same, and maybe that was just him sort of being like, you know, I understand that I understand the way this game goes now. Uh, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. But to me, what this has said the whole time is that the Red Bulls value him at such a level, and we talk about on the show all the time, oh, if you just get a Walker Zimmerman or an Ike Opara or whatever it is, you can change the fortunes of your team in an MLS if you make the right moves around them. Very potentially one year, I mean, the Red Bulls don't want to pack it in. They didn't yeah. go guy, hire get Gerhard Struber just to be like, meh. Like, if it's a couple million, we it's see a lot of swings and misses. We see a lot of swings and misses on center backs in this league at big numbers. Yeah. And so once you have one, I completely understand, and I know it would be tough for Aaron Long if that is his ambition, which he has said it is, to to be a part of that. But I understand why he would just say, you are 
a crux point in our team. And if we remove that that like stick from the bundle, we don't want to. We're not. We might crumble. We don't want to do that. You're worth more to us here. Yeah. Well, that see now that has to be to be better than the fifth place team in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, that's right? the thing, right? Like it has to be. It has to be. You're you're our guy here because we're going for it. Mm-hmm. We're, we are absolutely going for it. And um, as David said, Red Bulls fans haven't necessarily felt like that's been the case over the past six, seven years. Like as Which good as the that part, I don't as, understand. As good as the team has been, no, I mean we we know that multiple times they were like one piece away. Yeah, I'd say the last three years I get. Before that, they put together a team that they were going to compete with. But yes. We can have that debate there for is the next the, five months. The, the news with Aaron Long, by the way, which we didn't say, which we probably should have, is that there was a, a loan offer from the championship for Aaron Long. Uh, there were also the links with Liverpool. The and championship Liverpool. or a champion? Oh. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get why that was funny. Because Liverpool. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but you laughed, Doyle. Yeah, he that laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a good teammate, David. I yeah. laughed at all your bad jokes. <laughs> That's Give me one, How about this? One minute on Aaron Long in Liverpool. Live the dream, Doyle, for one minute. I don't dream a player playing for Liverpool. Okay, not uh, that dream. But, like, just, you know, just the inter- from an entertainment perspective, I, I'll dream that dream. Like Aaron Long getting that oppor- a short term loan to no, I mean it would it would be it would be incredible because they are the the EPL champions. They are the a team they they won the uh, you know the Champions League a couple of years ago. They play in a style that um, is very similar to Red Bull style, so I think that there wouldn't be a huge adjustment. I don't think that Aaron Long is uh, Liverpool level good long term. But I think as a stopgap measure for a back line that's been decimated by injuries, worse than decimated, that's been completely wiped out by injuries, he would make a lot of sense. And, of course, if he plays well for Liverpool, even at age 28, um, if he plays well for, for three months for Liverpool, then Red Bull would likely get the, the type of deal that would be too good to say no to. Decent clearinghouse going and playing for the champions. Yeah, right? <laughs> but that would be unprecedented in that. A team, a big team in Europe looking to fill an injury-filled spot. Not unprecedented. Landon Donovan, yes, 2009, fair. Bayern Munich. He was the greatest player in U.S. national team history, <laughs> not a guy on Red Bull who sort of is around the national team. But, yeah, that would be the cool part of that is just, like, what does that window open up in terms of right. now big teams looking for players? Oh, is there a left back at Dallas that we need just on loan? To cover say, the his rest of the say his name, Ryan Hollingshead. Let's go. Yeah, there. Well, yeah, no, speak it. it. Speak it into reality. And that's, the, and that's the thing that we're talking about here is because there's a, and we all know it because we we live in it. But there's a sense among the fan base, more than a sense. There's an outspoken part of the fan base that's like, yeah, but he just plays in MLS. Yeah, but it's just mm-hmm. MLS. And if suddenly Liverpool is looking for MLS players to, to fill their needs or Roma is spending $10 million on an MLS player who has 1,500 minutes, uh, you know, like what if, I don't know, what if Everton say, okay, Pickford has little T-Rex arms, we need a real goalkeeper. They, <laughs> like this stuff, this stuff matters to the overall perception of the league and fighting through that perception um, is – one of the best things that that MLS can do. So again, I'll say it, it only makes the league stronger to see these types of moves. It only puts the league in a better place in the immediate and going forward. I'm a little worried because Doyle there making an attempt to get a loan move to a the Express or the Sun Mirror, ripping Jordan Pickford, which is a classic English media move. So we got to watch out. Doyle might be the one who's it's, next. It's deadline day. It's deadline day. Can he get on a chopper and get that physical? Can he pass a physical? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I can personally. You can ask me to run. Nah, I think we're gonna have to call this move off. This isn't gonna work out for me. But here's another spin. So we've talked about all these different spins. You have like the veteran that could go help a top tier team. You have Brian Reynolds going to a Champions League tier team uh, as a prospect. What about Chris Richards now? He's gone on loan to Hoffenheim. That's like rewind it back even more. That's straight out of the academy to Bayern Munich and their youth teams have a sell-on clause on loan to Hoffenheim. If he performs, maybe they have a number for him, or he goes back to Bayern and has a better chance. There are so many different paths. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it. And, and I'm really glad that, that 
Richards got this loan because I think he is probably our young center back with the highest upside, but he hasn't been good enough to break through for Bayern Munich, which is obviously a huge ask. And I think when he's played for Bayern, the first team, he's got a couple hundred minutes. Mostly it's been at right back. Yeah. Um, and he's mostly looked pretty uncomfortable and not up to the level. Well, the head coach at Hoffenheim, I believe was a head coach with Bayern's reserves last year. So he's obviously very familiar with, with Rich, Chris Richards. He is still, I think, a, a top tier prospect. And now at age 21, he's got to get real minutes. He should have the opportunity here with Hoffenheim to get real minutes, which again is a win for FC Dallas. It's a win for MLS. It's a win, hopefully, for the kid and for the U.S. national team. I think it's Uli Honess's nephew is the coach. So what there's like a heavy Bayern connection. Uh, and as you said, he coached him at the youth. Bank. I just also... It's super exciting when Americans play for Barcelona and Juve. But we can't, like, get crazy where if his career is a starter for a team like Hoffenheim, a mid-table, that's amazing. And that's a starter for the national team probably and in the pool. And that is part of the thing with these players is you go to these big teams, sometimes it's just to find your level. Matt Miazga might be a starter for Anderlecht. That might be his career. That is a great spot. That's a really good career. Right. He went to Chelsea to find that spot. And so it's great to see the big flash move. You need the player to find their level. And a lot of these levels are still higher than what we had anyone in the pool at at times over the last 20 years. And that could just be a guy competing for a spot. Uh, Speaking of a guy who went to a lot of different levels, Josie Althor did not play in January camp. I personally wanted to see him play. I know you guys said he didn't need like a reward. He didn't play in the friendly. He played in the camp. That's true. That's a He's good played week. soccer for the last three true. and a half weeks. He is Don't trained. He is yeah. trained. There have been some cryptic things, both tweeted and said, about Josie's future. Greg Berhalter did say, uh, I believe post-game uh, here, but basically that it's it's not his place, but there, there is interest in Josie Altidore. Jo- pre-game, excuse me. Uh, Josie had a tweet that um, basically, don't believe everything. Don't believe everything you hear, read, or see. The devil's at work. I don't know what to make of this, but I am very interested in seeing Josie Althador potentially go out on loan. Uh, always been a huge Josie stan. Always felt just both terrible as a national team fan, but more for Josie that his, his big tournaments just didn't work out the way he wanted them to. And in a lot of ways, I'm like, take him to the Olympics. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I want to see that. He's been playing the hype man. Like, he would be an incredible uh, – that would be an incredible way to, like – now, I'm not saying finish his career, but have an opportunity to sort of have a little bit of a reset on the major tournament thing to be a part of a group that clearly he's about. But let's go back to the transfer. Could Juice, could he be moving? Is that possible? The rumors in the past have been Mexican clubs. I think mm. there was a rumor out of China a, few, a year or so ago. I think that was kind of when his contract was starting to run down with Toronto. I, 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 I don't think an MLS team is going to go be able to get him or try and get him. So it would be outside the league, which... It's been a tough year for him. It's been a tough year for everyone, though. Um, So it'd be interesting to see him kind of like reset himself at a different club, a different challenge. And I think one of the things you see with Josie is every time it's something new, he kind of gets reinvigorated. And then you see the Josie that can dominate games. And so maybe that's what he needs right now in his career, especially with the conversation we're having, which is – and it was funny because my girlfriend kept asking me about, like, who's the number nine? Who's the forward for the U.S.? Because we're watching the game yesterday, what this all means. Wait, Megan was – she's like, she's like, who's the nine? She's she was like, very interested by what was going on at forward, and Daryl DK oh, came wow. on, and we had this whole conversation. She knows everything about okay, Matt I just Turner didn't know. I didn't know what, which positional battle was, like, the one yeah. that she was she doesn't most res- honed in on right now. She's similar to, like, I guess you could say, Bobby. She doesn't respect forwards, but she oh, needs boy. to know which one is. <laughs> We're lazy. Everyone knows that. Um, so it, it is the one position where there is no one person that we expect to take it. And we've talked about this a million times. We think it'll be Sargent. It could be Matthew Hoppy. It could be I'm all high on the carpet. All of this is could be where every other spot, there is someone who should take it over if their career progresses the way we think it will. And so for Josie, if this is let's go somewhere else and let's score goals in Europe or in Mexico for six, seven months going into World Cup qualifying and Gold Cup and Nations League final. And is that a way to show with fewer national team camps going into that, that I'm the guy still? And that could be an interesting turn for him to take here over the next year. I'm interested. I'll say it again. 
take him to the Olympics. <laughs> Weeby just wants moves. I don't think you could take him to the Olympics because I know, the, I know it's, it's, a, it's a smaller, it's a smaller roster, and you can't afford a guy who can't stay healthy through. Yeah, but that's what you're saying. Tournament. That's what your logical side is saying. I'm not. I'm talking with my heart right now. I'm speaking with my heart. I want I want Josie Althor at a major tournament, scoring goals and driving the U.S. Far. So I, I want him as the the 2022 center forward super sub, the, th- 35 minutes a game in if that in at the World Cup. I want him to finally get that World Cup goal because that's been uh, you know kind of hanging over his head. I think since 2014, uh, really 2010. So uh, fingers crossed for that, but we're a long ways away. Hey man. He'll be the one that's on every like four four two magazine starting depth chart for the U.S. because they've heard of him, right? But he doesn't actually start for the U.S. And you'll be like, "Well, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the thing now, that. man. Like, like all these magazines have finally heard of American True. players. True. And you know, magazines, I, magazines, I what, magazines aren't even a thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, like, what's we, a we get to this point, we're like, "Look at this new world!" But are the yeah. magazines talking about us? Are we on the cover of traditional media? <laughs> oh, we gonna oh, talk yeah. radio for a second? <laughs> oh. oh man around mls crew signed perry kitchen we know the connections there akron perry could probably play a little center back could play a little defensive midfield uh they just they keep kind of reinforcing uh portland signed another outside back <laughs> jose carlos van ranken from chivas so then i have uh two new fullbacks it's nice for him to go to a, a, a big club <laughs> Any thoughts on uh, either of those moves? I mean, we're kind of it's, like we're kind of waiting around, right? Because it's it's the transfer window, and yeah, well, I think transfer Portland, window in MLS doesn't open until next. Well, week, right? yeah, but I'm saying the the to push abroad maybe, but not incoming. Yeah, the, for Portland, it's win now. Every move, I, I know the left back's like 22 or 23, and they think he's got potential. Um, but it's win now moves for them, and it's I think around. They, they think he's one of the best of the position in the league. Yeah, for sure. But this guy's 27. The center backs are both 30, 30 plus. Uh, they haven't gotten younger in a lot of places. Even Felipe Mora is 27, 28. I'm just saying the whole, everything's geared towards winning in the end of Charo's window, however long that might be, which might be 10 more years. Valerian, Sebastian Blanco when he comes back. And without Blanco, they're a good team. With Blanco, they're an MLS Cup contender. This establishes that. Long term, it makes their roster builds fairly difficult. They've given up domestic fullbacks in Viafania and Farfan. One on a homegrown deal, which is kind of how MLS teams can build because you can save, you know, positions here and then spend big in other spots. But at the same time, they've got guys in Chara and Valeri that other teams would kill to have right. in those opportunities. So it'll be interesting going forward. But I think for the next two years, it just can continues that Portland is a cup contender. All right. Extra time mailbag 401 206 MLS. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. What do we got in there? Well, we got really excited about U.S. national team and players abroad for 45 minutes, so now we're just going to go back into it. Ryan from Juarez says, on last Thursday's show, the segment on the U.S. M&T made me realize I shared Weeby's sentiment of not paying much attention to this year's January camp. I realized in past years this was the only thing to pay attention to, soccer-wise, for us fans in January. That has changed because of the European movement as so many players are earning significant minutes abroad. Then I also realized the purpose of this camp has changed from who are those fringe MLS players that could fill holes in the starting to 11 to who are depth pieces. 2020's only redeeming factors for U.S. soccer fans as talent is doing incredible, exciting, groundbreaking things, and the bell has begun to rung for players like Morris Ariola, Long and Legette, potentially getting over to Europe as well to maintain their U.S. 17 spot. So Ryan, so, so far as agrees. Let me just say, I don't think it's that clear cut. I don't think that Legette is out of the starting 11. 100%. He's, he's he, got a shout for sure. Yeah, if, if he doesn't go to Europe, I don't think he's he's out of the automatically out of the starting 11. I think it's the same for Long as well. Uh, I do think that, look, we, we all know that the top five leagues in the world are the top five leagues in the world. So I do think that in Greg Berhalter's eyes, in any national team coach's eyes, getting into those top five leagues in the world and playing regularly and playing well is a really great way to solidify your role with the national team. But I don't think that if, if Legette and Long and Ariola all and, and Yule, these guys who have been contributors to the national team over the past couple of years, starters for, for the past couple of years, I don't think that their spot is gone if they stay in MLS, because the fact is MLS is a much better league than 
people realize. Um, and that's why clubs in the top five leagues in the world are shopping here. Like you're not out of the, the Spanish national team if you're playing for Benfica. Like that's the way that that it has to be looked at uh, in terms of what this new era means for MLS and the players and the U.S. and eventually Canadian national teams. Well, and if you connect it all together, what really what MLS – wants and needs and, and should be, we've talked about so many times, is that when you're talking about that national team starter that plays for Chelsea, it is, all right, let's just rewind, that, that national team starter let's do Canada that plays and starts for Bayern Munich and has been arguably one of the best players in the world at their position in Alfonso Davies is the Vancouver Whitecaps developed, got a transfer fee, re reinvested back in and are producing more of right. said players. Like you want to be so-and-so playing in Europe that started their career in MLS. Yep. And it's starting to be more and more and more and more that way. And I, th I just feel like we're hitting sort of the beginnings of what I hope is more. There was a debate I saw online about sort of golden generations and whether this was one, because it feels like one, or whether this was sort of the, the first the wave. Normal. And we were like, Start oh, dang, we didn't have a tide before. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, now we, we, we were like, dude, we were, it was lapping at our feet. Because there's now a process. We got a, yeah, we got a little bit of a roaring wave. And rather than thinking that's the biggest thing coming, that maybe that this is just the first of many. Yeah, it's nice. not just, oh, Inland Empire has great players and they get to play against each other, or Manny Shelchite found a bunch of kids that got to compete against each other in New Jersey and they ended up being really good because they had that. This is, there's a process to this whole thing and it works and it will continue to work and obviously off and on. But you spoke of the Vancouver Whitecaps, mm. which is perfect. Takes me into Murray Jaggard's email here. He says, hey guys, longtime listener, huge fan of the show, wants to write about my serotonin moment as a Whitecaps fan. October 25th, 2014. It's a rainy Vancouver day. My father, my best friend, and I just completed the 11-hour drive the previous day for our annual Whitecaps Recon road trip. Whitecaps are playing the Rapids with the final playoff spot in the Western Conference on the line. The Timbers, the only other team that can get in, they win, which means Vancouver has to win. And we find out heading into halftime at nil-nil in BC Place in the 69th minute. Pedro Morales nice. steps up to take a corner kick. After a foul, and the entire stadium gets on their feet, you guys know what happens next. Kendall Waston puts in the header. BC Place explodes. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. Kendall Waston's celebration, now famous among Caps fans, summed it up pretty well. David O said makes some huge saves. I get goosebumps every time I rewatch the highlights from this game. This is exactly what we're talking about. And then Murray follows up with this, which... Our heart goes out to him. He says, his memory has been even more special. Recently, my father unexpectedly passed away. In May of 2020, I haven't seen a Caps game in person without my dad since before we started annual road trip in 2013. I know it's going to be bittersweet to walk into BC Place. Sent us a photo of them together. So our heart goes out to him. We're glad he still has that memory. And we are very excited for when that comes back for all of us. That Kendall Lawson goal is like yeah. one of – that's my white caps sort of like defining moment in my head. Yeah. If, I mean, that, that was – well, I'm going to say that Alfonso Davies' goals that he scored right before he left were probably the defining moments for me. But like, and then the Hosley goal. But like, that was probably the best Whitecaps team, right? The twenty was it twenty four? No, it was a 2015 team that actually went in and was that same group. It was Pedro Morales, it was Kendall Waston, um, and it was Kakuta Mane, and they mm -hmm. went into the playoffs and they were beating the hell out of the Timbers, and then Mane like broke his leg or. I don't remember what it was, but yeah. like damages and like, he's never been the same player. And you could argue that the caps just haven't been the same since then. So here's the you know, fingers crossed that for, for our friend from Calgary, um, that he gets a, a winning team to root for in the coming years. The Diber Caicedo train is off Kaiseido and running. I this know you, like good, you know, this looks like a good signing, right? Because yeah. Caicedo's young, but he's not, purely a prospect he's got like four thousand first team minutes so this is exciting i like to see hope it works out for the white caps for murray uh thoughts to you man thoughts to you and your family awesome to have that tradition with your dad and i'm sure you'll think back on that uh with fond memories those are the things i was thinking about as this uh, as i was hearing this is just like those moments that we're missing right now those are the serotonin yeah. moments um you know I've, I've been thinking about we're in kansas city now taking for the first time my uh, Cameron to the game and how like incredible that will be to him as a kid who just for the last X years, X months of his life, it feels like years, hasn't had those big communal, incredible culture experiences that I think are in large part, probably what made us all fall in love with this game, whether those are playing with our friends or 
you know, playing on our, our youth teams or coaching our kids or going to the game and being taken by your dad. I mean, having that moment when you walk out of the, the concourse and you see the field, all these sort of like very formational moments for me that yeah. we're just, we're not getting them, but maybe more importantly in some ways, and maybe this is something that we got to lead as a, as a podcast with people in this culture of like inoculating that next generation. I was going to say, them. it's funny. We yeah. talked about our serotonin moments a lot and kind of had some going through my head after. And I realized so many of them weren't at the games, right? It was going to the bar to watch the game, going yeah. to watch Copa. And I was watching the Copa Lib final and was like, I have, you know, their weekday games, their night games. So I kind of had made a point over the last few years. I go to an Argentine restaurant. I go to a Brazilian steakhouse, whatever it is to watch. And like, that is some of the best moments I've ever had watching soccer. And just even having your local bar to go into for you know european games and mls games on a weekend and just knowing who's going to be there and watch and i think that's a big soccer thing that we're missing out on right now i'm thinking about just getting pizza in the strip mall outside red bull arena you know <laughs> having pizza. a great yeah dude having a good having a good day and knowing you got a long trip on the path train to go back in and with the guy mike grella's jersey on the, yeah. on the wall next to del piero 100 percent, man 100 percent. uh missing it missing it real bad I'm sure you are out there as well. We love to hear these serotonin moments. It's a good way to sort of remember uh, what was and what will be. So uh, keep doing the right things out there. Keep being safe. Keeping your family safe. Uh, hopefully we're turning this, this corner very, very soon. That's it from us. We'll be back on Thursday. Probably talking more national teams. See so if you have thoughts. Hit us up. Uh, Canadian folks out there, take us to task. Tell us what we're missing or should be talking about. Johnny David. Kyle Larry. score this weekend looks good, though. Looks Another good. win. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's running the show at Lille, which is impressive in its own right. Yep. It's going to be interesting to see what Herdman does because, yeah. like, he has four starting center forwards and then, like, some pretty obvious weaknesses. Out. We'll do a Canadian national yeah, team. Show, yeah, so. we almost Steve broke Esquizito down. Steve getting a move this weekend. Whoa, getting a permanent whoa, transfer. whoa. We're pulling yeah, ourselves back in, huh? I'm pulling us out. We'll see you on Thursday.